Today, congregation, we come to an interesting position in our series on lesser-known biblical figures. This sermon will serve as a kind of transition between our current series and our next series, which is a three-week series on the church. On an unrelated note, I have the next three weeks off from preaching, the longest break I've had since the church was founded. I'm very blessed to have this opportunity to rest a bit. As such breaks always seem to recharge my preaching batteries, so to speak. I still plan on being here, just not as the preacher. Pastor Randall will be handling the majority of those duties. As for today's sermon, we will be looking at a passage that merges our current series and the next series together. It links it together. We will look at a series of lesser-known biblical figures to help us see three key traits of a church, notably a, a healthy church. Today's text is Romans 16, 1-9, and we will be looking at ten minor characters in this section. I know in the previous weeks we've looked at one or two people. Today we're looking at ten. These verses come at the end of the book of Romans, the 16th chapter being its last. The chapter begins with Paul writing short sentences directed at individuals who belong to the church in Rome. He would write things like this, greet so-and-so who does this and this, or something along those lines. Paul was saying hello to his friends in Rome, essentially, telling telling the uh, readers of the letter to give his regards to these people. These were greetings of love. Many people will skip over this section and consider it uh, unimportant. But let let me remind you that this is still God's word. Even the little greetings at the end of Romans 16 were written under the inspiration of the Spirit. We are told that all scripture is profitable. So let's come to this section seeking to spiritually profit from these verses. Paul's greetings extend past verse 9, but I think we have enough material to cover in just these nine verses. As mentioned earlier, this section covers three key traits of a church. So let's examine those traits under these three headings. First, a church should be committed to service and sacrifice. A church should be a mix of spiritually young and mature. And a church should be loving. First, I'd like you to consider uh, a few things under this heading. Let us consider the fact that the church should be committed to service and sacrifice. In the first two verses of this text, we meet the first figure we'll be examining today, Phoebe. Phoebe gets, um, excuse me, people get tripped up a bit with Phoebe, and I'll explain why in a bit, but let's read the text, the first two verses of Romans 16. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sancria, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and help her in a way, excuse me, help her in whatever way she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many, and of myself as well. People get hung up on the word servant in verse 1. In Greek, the word is closely related to uh, where we get the word deacon from. In fact, the NIV translates the word to deacon. A deacon, if you remember, is a church officer along with the elder, as described in Paul's pastoral epistles. Now, here's the issue. Some people see that Phoebe is described as a deacon in certain translations. And they think about how, in Paul's letters, one of the qualifications to be a deacon is to be a man. But here in Romans 16, Phoebe is a woman. How can that be? Well, it's quite simple. To be a deacon is to be a servant. Phoebe is a servant of the church, but she does not hold the office of a deacon. And that's why we see the word servant in the ESV, in the King James, in the NASB, and in other translations. With that out of the way, with the fact that Phoebe is a servant of sorts, let's look at the text a bit further. 
Here, Paul commends the dear sister to the church in Rome. One commenter says this, It has been inferred that she was one of the party to which St. Paul entrusted his epistle, if not the actual bearer of it herself. So she probably arrived at Rome when the letter arrived. She might have been the one carrying it or with the people who were delivering it. And how is she to be greeted when she got there? Paul says, welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. Paul says to meet her needs. Anything she needs, do it for her. Why? Paul tells us why. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. It is most likely that Phoebe was a woman of considerable wealth for the time. Matthew Poole writes, she had been hospitable to many, and in particular to the apostle himself. This showeth she was a woman of some account. That is to say, this shows that she had a little bit of money in her bank account, so to speak. So here she is. Here's a woman that is in a good financial situation, enough of a, a, a positive outlook financially to be able to provide hospitality to the apostle. And we know that she used her resources to aid the ministry. She has assisted many people, and as Paul notes himself as well. The apostle now tells uh, the church in Rome to help her, greet her, and welcome her. Assist her with what she needs. And that should be a lesson to us about hospitality. Let us welcome the brothers and sisters who are servants of the Lord. We need to aid them. There's really only two, two positions to be in. You either are the one going out and doing the work, or you're the one supporting those who are going out and doing the work. On June 12th, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have a visiting preacher. He's a friend of mine. We'll pro he'll probably be accompanied by a few other guests who are our mutual friends. Congregation, I hope you will greet them, as Paul describes, in a way worthy of the saints, in a warm, loving, kind, and sacrificial way. Here's an opportunity to apply this verse in your life. But there's another lesson to learn from these first two verses of Romans 16. Consider what we know about her. All we really know about her is that she served Christ with what she had. Let me ask you this, congregation. If someone were introducing you specifically as an individual to a group of people, how would they do so? If they were being truthful, what would they say? Here is Bob, who has done nothing with his life. Or, uh, here is Susie, who spends her time doing meaningless things. Or would we say, here is a servant of Jesus Christ. If someone had to accurately describe you, how would you be described? If we claim to be followers of Christ, we say that we walk in his footsteps. We should be known as his servants then, shouldn't we? I'm not saying that we're, we should do this to try to have recognition from people, to have a good title so we feel good about ourselves. That's not the goal. What I'm saying is this. If you are known as a servant in the church, you probably are doing something right. Therefore, we should strive to be servants and therefore have such a reputation, not to have a reputation for reputation's sake alone. But we should let that reputation be a reflection of who we actually are, or should be, servants. Now, let's move on to Prisca and Aquila. I want to first note that Prisca is sometimes known as Priscilla. This was a husband and wife team. Interestingly, we see them in other places in the Bible, which means they're probably the most well-known figures of this section. If you remember these names at all, you probably remember them from Acts chapter 18. Paul stays with them. and Both Paul and the couple were tent makers, so they, I assume, had a lot to talk about. 
I'm leaving out some of the details of their story, but the most notable thing they did in Acts 18 was correcting Apollos. He was a preacher that only knew about the baptism of John, yet he was accurate when teaching about Jesus. Acts 18.26 says that the couple took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. We then read about how Apollos was a powerful preacher who proved from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. I'm sure that Priscilla and Aquila helped him in those endeavors. So we see already that they're working for the Lord. But what does our section in Romans 16 tell us about this dynamic duo? Let's look at verses 3, 4, and the beginning of 5. Paul writes, Greek Prisca and Aquila, again that's Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. So not only did a church meet in their house, which shows that they were willing to be hospitable and welcoming and willing to meet the needs of a local congregation, but it also seems that these two served a great number of churches. See what Paul says, he says, all the Gentile churches gave them thanks. They must have really uh, done a lot of work all around the area that Christianity was spreading in. And the, all the Gentile churches know about Priscilla and Aquila. These two even risked their necks for Paul, we read. So when did that happen? We're not sure exactly. Commenters like to speculate on these things and give us guesses, which are helpful, but we can't know for sure. Uh, Paul was hated by the Jews, so perhaps they sheltered him from persecution when Paul stayed with them. We don't know, but what we do know is that they risked their lives for Paul. Regardless, let us observe two other points that we can <clears throat> draw from these verses. First, church members should be willing to lay down their lives for the brothers and sisters. We have a great example of this in Priscilla and Aquila. We've read uh, 1 John 3.16 many times. It tells us how we know what love is. We see it best in the example of Christ. There sh therefore, we should lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters, just as Christ gave himself up for us, Priscilla and Aquila, we're only following Christ's example. Let me ask you, congregation, when have you sacrificed yourself for another Christian? Maybe put your reputation on the line, or sacrificed some money that you would like to spend on yourself for a brother or sister who is struggling. When's the last time you've done anything like that? Not because you're related to them, not because you stand to gain something from helping them, or because of the social pressure to do so, but just because they're a fellow Christian. Have you risked your neck for another believer? Another point, we should be serving together. We see in Priscilla and Aquila a wonderful testimony of how Christ unites his people. How do you think their marriage was? It was probably really good. I'm sure it was a great one. When marriages have a solid foundation in Christ, they are healthy. If you have family members that are Christians, if you have friends that are Christians, serve Christ together. Few things speak more clearly about the power of Christ than a church that is united together for one singular purpose, that is to bring glory to God. Think about how uh, powerful this kind of testimony would be if the world would see a church that is united together for one purpose, and in that local church, families that are not broken, families that are uh, all caring for one another and pressing uh, forward for the sake of the gospel. We live in a world where families are broken, and fathers and mothers and sons and daughters are turned against each other, but here the gospel is a uniter of believers. If any church including our own, is to prosper. We must work in harmony with one another. I think, if I'm being honest, congregation, we have room for improvement in that regard. We have met three characters thus far. I'd like to introduce to you a few more under this heading. 
I want to show you how many people are regarded as servants, as fellow workers in this section. Look at verse 6. Here we meet Mary. That's a name we've heard before in the Bible. There are several Marys in the Bible, and this one we know very little about. I don't think um, there's any reason to think that this is the mother of Jesus or Mary Magdalene. It's probably a different Mary altogether. We know that Paul knew her, and we knew that she was in the church in Rome. But what else do we know about her? Well, Paul says, she worked hard for you. She worked hard for the brothers and sisters around her at the church. Let's meet another hard worker, Urbanus. Paul says, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. Now, if one were to read this section in Romans 16, one might get the impression that everyone was serving. Paul calls several people, fellow workers or people who worked hard, and that's how a church should operate. Every member of the church should be doing their part. This is not an option. If you are to be faithful and obedient to Christ, there needs to be some effort put forth on your part to serve the local body. And I'm not talking about the bare minimum either. Putting the room back together after the service is not enough. Five minutes a week is not being a servant. Although I, I would like some help at the end of the service putting the room back together. I'm not saying that. But let me ask, what are you doing during the week as a servant of Christ? How are you serving the local body and the global church? So let's read back all the points under this heading. First, we should welcome the servants of the Lord. We are to be hospitable. Two, we should be known as servants. We should be working so hard that people know us as servants. Again, not to have a reputation so we can feel good about ourselves, but so that um, we should let this reputation be a reflection of who we actually are. Three, we should lay down our lives for one another in love. Four, we should serve together, not as lone wolves, but we should all work together for one cause, teaming up as there are strength and numbers. And five, we should all be working. It's a commandment for all. This is an example for all. May the Spirit lead us in these matters. Moving on to the second heading, the church should be a mix of both the young in the faith and the mature in the faith. That is, the church should be filled with all different kinds of people in all different walks of life. In the church, there is to be diversity in race and in class. We shouldn't exclude people based on those things, certainly not. But also, we shouldn't exclude people due to uh, their spiritual age, if you will, or how mature they are in the Lord. Let's look at the second part of verse 5 in Romans 16. It says, Greet my beloved Epanetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. This Epanetus figure was apparently converted under Paul's ministry in Asia and was the first one to do so. The Greek uses the term first fruits to describe him being the first convert. Now, let's look at verse 7, and we'll tie these two together. We meet Andronicus and Junia. Paul says that they were in Christ before me. That is to say that they became Christians before Paul. So in the Church of Rome, we have people who converted before Paul even became an apostle, or before Paul even was a Christian, and we see someone who was converted under Paul's ministry. This shows us that in a church, people will be in different places in their walks with the Lord. Unfortunately, many churches are imbalanced in this regard. Some churches only contain recent converts, it seems. And some are only filled with very old saints. In some circumstances, this is understandable. But often, especially in America, I find it is a point of pride. Perhaps you've been to a church that seemingly only has young people in it. Many of them have not walked with the Lord for very long. There's not a gray hair in sight. And that's by design. The church is for the young and the trendy. And it's set up this way. 
Not only is this arrogant and foolish, but it is detrimental to the health of the church. I'll tell you why here in a bit. But let's look at the other extreme. I'm in my 30s now, but not so long ago. I was in my 20s, and I'm still missing those days when I was back in my 20s. And if you were a Christian in your 20s or even in your teenage years, you might have gone to a church that made you feel alienated. Why is that? Because you were the youngest one there by several decades. Has that ever happened to you? It feels very unwelcoming, not only if, because you're the youngest one there, but also because you are kind of excluded because you're so young. People cannot be bothered to learn your name if you haven't been there for several years. Maybe you've been in that kind of situation. I suppose that's just as off-putting as an older believer going to one of those hip young churches. Anyway, a church that caters only to older, uh, mature believers in Christ is often designed that way. And again, such a design is often motivated by pride. It's a form of tribalism in both cases. So first, I want to warn you against the dangers of both extremes. I've seen it happen in churches before, and sometimes you, you, uh, you might see this happen with young people in youth groups and in um, young adults groups. They'll come on Sunday morning and meet with everyone, but the young people want, really, they're there for the, the fellowship with the young people, and that's really all they care about. By either being cool and young or very stuffy and only focused on the mature believers in Christ, you're risking alienating Christians either way, who are your brothers and sisters. Fortunately, though, the Bible tells us how both the mature and young in Christ need to interact. Children are to, are to obey their parents. Older men are not to be rebu rebuked sharply, but rather appealed to as a father, says 1 Timothy 5.1. However, the best example of these relationships are, uh, excuse me, the best example of what these relationships are to look like can be seen in Titus 2. I'll give you an example of how older and younger women are to interact. Is Titus 2, 3 to 5. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands. The word of God may not be reviled. And did you see how in those verses the older women are to teach the younger? It shows us that both kinds of people should be found in a church, or at least welcomed in a church. Without those who are older in the faith, new believers will lack wisdom and guidance. Without younger believers, the mature in the faith will have nobody to impart wisdom to, and will fail in the duty of disciple-making. This is why alienating either group is dangerous. So we have established that the church should be committed to service, and it should be of different spiritual maturity levels, or at least welcoming those who are in different stages of their walk with the Lord. Now let's consider our final heading, the church is to be loving. Now one might make the argument that to serve is to love, and this is just a retreading of the first heading, but please allow me to clarify. True service is a manifestation of love, that's how we see love shown, but it is possible to serve in a robotic and cold way. Love must be the motivating factor in our service. I'm only going to make a singular point under this heading, but I think it'll kind of uh, cover what, what is necessary here for us to see. So let's look at the language used in these verses, and we'll see where we can find examples of love. We've seen the term beloved previously in our text as Eupanitus was called my beloved Eupanitus by Paul. However, I'd like to briefly introduce you to two more figures that share a similar greeting. First, we meet... <laughs> I have a hard time with these, but it's Aplaetus in verse 8. I wrote down the pronunciation so I could get it right. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Also, at the end of verse 9, the Romans are told to greet Stachus. Consider for a moment the phrase used in verse 8, my beloved in the Lord. Where do you think Paul uses that specific phrase? Paul wanted to show you that he loved him 
primarily because he was a brother. Matthew Poole writes, This is added to show that he did not love him for his riches or any outward respect, but for the Lord's sake, for the grace of Christ, which appeared in him. Consider also Statius of verse 9. If history is to be considered, he was an important figure. History could be wrong, of course, but multiple commentators have noted that he was believed to be the bishop of Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire. Now, did Paul draw your attention to that, this huge figure in the church? No. He didn't elevate him at all. Again, Paul loved him for the Lord's sake, because of who he was in Christ, not because he was an important figure. How often are we to be quick, uh, quickly drawn to people who are successful, or attractive people, or people with charisma, or rich people, people that are, in the eyes of the world, popular and successful? One way you can spot a healthy church is to observe how it regards its lowliest members. Look at the poorest congregants who are struggling through life, are cared for and loved just as much as the most prominent and successful people of the congregation. It speaks volumes about the health of that church. Conversely, if people flock to the successful but hardly acknowledge the lowly, that church is a serious love problem. Well, we have seen that a church is to be filled with service and love of people of different, uh, differing spiritual maturity. This group of people, the church, is a group of people who have been called to love and serve as they follow their master's footsteps. The head of the church, Jesus Christ, gave himself as a sacrifice on the cross to atone for their sins. Anyone who turns to Christ in faith will not be punished by God for their sins, but instead will be forgiven, brought into the family of God, and will become a part of the church. If you have not turned to Christ, I urge you to do so. The church is the only group on the planet that is right with the Almighty and Sovereign God. It would be a terrible thing to be considered an enemy of God on Judgment Day and the rest of eternity in hell. For believers, the message is very simple, isn't it? We all need to spend some time considering our own actions and contributions to the health of the local church. As always, let us consider Christ himself as our blueprint. The people described in Romans 16 are good examples. Christ is the best example. He came to serve. He came in love. He is the one we look to. Read the Gospels and see how he lovingly laid down his life for us, suffering the unfettered wrath of God for us. Read about how he taught the apostles, fed the hungry, and cured the sick. Congregation, are these things of interest to you at all? Do you long to live for the Lord? Is the aim of your life, the very desire of your heart, to please God? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, so says our Lord. Let's consider these things, congregation. I cannot flippantly flow through life. We need to be intentional in our actions. How can we as followers of Christ not follow him with our actions? Let us serve as Christ served and love as Christ loved. Seriously, take an inventory of yourself and see where you can improve in these areas. Let me leave you with these words from Paul, which is a command from God himself. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 tells us to be always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Are you laboring, congregation? Let us consider these things this week. We go out into the world that needs this gospel message so much.